Hello, welcome. Um, thanks very, very much indeed for joining us this evening. And uh, welcome to the online book launch for a British book collector, rare books and manuscripts in the Ari Hart collection. Oh, look, we're there. In the Blackburn Museum and Gallery. I'm delighted Hello, where are you? to see you all here. And it's a joy to see the inside of the museum where Blackburn curators Caroline Wilkinson and Anthea Perkis will be sharing with us a selection of early printed material and manuscripts which we presented in A British Book Collector. Blackburn holds the rare book and numismatic collections of Robert Edward Hart, a local rope maker who bequeathed his collections to the museum upon his death in 1946. The book is the latest output from the academic partnership between the Blackburn Museum and the Institute of English Studies at the University of London. The articles in this volume were first presented at a conference at Blackburn College in 2017. And I must say that we've all found it uh, somewhat miraculous um, as writers, publishers, uh, printers, and um, uh, the holders of um, image repositories that we've managed to produce the book in the context of this year. Joining us tonight are Francesca Manzari, Professor of the History of Art at Sapienza University in Rome, Scott McKendrick, Head of Western Heritage at the British Library, Eric Marshall White, um, Shaidi Librarian and Assistant Librarian for Special Collections, Books and Manuscripts at Princeton University Library. Rebecca Darley, Senior Lecturer in Medieval History at Birkbeck University of London. David McKittrick, Fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge, and Emeritus Honorary Professor of Historical Bibliography at Cambridge. And Dr. Cleo Cantone, whose expertise in Islamic and Persian material has most recently focused on mosque architecture in Africa. David and Cleo are not presenting visual material tonight, but would be delighted to answer questions in the Q&A on Hart's Islamic material and his contemporary collecting context. So there's a little bit of complicated housekeeping before we begin, and a little bit of this is brand new to me as of just a few moments ago. Um, because of the technical complexities of our presenters being um, from really a variety of time zones and in different places, um, we've got a little technical challenge. If you would like to see the manuscript that is being discussed uh, in your center screen, you'll need to pin the manuscript. So you'll need to go to your uh, the um, viewing pane that shows you and in the right hand upper right hand corner, you click and some little dots will appear. A menu appears and then if you press pin, the manuscript will miraculously appear in the center of your screen. If that's complicated, you'll still see the manuscript in the little viewing pane, um, but I do recommend trying to pin it. Um, Francesca, would you explain that please in Italian because I think we have a lot of Italian um, uh, uh, viewers tonight. Certainly. Allora, traduco l'ultima informazione per il pubblico italiano eh, perché è una informazione tecnica importante. E per vedere il manoscritto che scorreremo insieme eh, come, come video centrale, come immagine centrale, e dovete ehm, rendere quella immagine eh, pinnata, anche nei computer italiani il termine pin, quindi dovete andare in alto dove ci sono i quadratini, ehm, cliccare e eh, c'è scritto pin video e cliccando lì si ferma l'immagine sul manoscritto, altrimenti vedrete eh, l'oratore e quindi piuttosto che il manoscritto che verrà sfogliato mentre noi parleremo. Grazie a tutti quanti. Ok. Ok, thank you very much Francesca. Any other languages? Anyone would like? Anyway. Ok, I hope it's clear. Um, you'll be muted during uh, the, uh, the presentations um, and uh, automatic live captioning is available throughout the event. Um, but if you don't want to see this, I never like to see it. 
um, you just uh, uh, click on um, the uh, live transcript button and select hide subtitles. We'll proceed through all four 10 minute talks before the Q&A session at the close of the evening. During the Q&A session, please post your questions in the chat um, or indicate in the chat that you'd like to ask a question and I will then put your question to the appropriate person. The launch itself is being recorded, um, but if it's uh, decided to be made public at some stage, the Q&A will be edited out. And that's it. Um, we're now ready to begin. So um, the, and I just also wanted to say that the quality of the images that you're seeing will be uh, affected by the sort of device you're viewing on. But anyway, we've, we've done our best. We've done our best. Okay, so um, we will now uh, begin with uh, Francesca Mansari, who is speaking on the Blackburn missile. Francesca. Thank you, thank you very much. I would like to thank Cynthia very much for this um, opportunity. Um, uh, it's really wonderful to be able to uh, call attention to a really lovely book edited by her, um, to a gorgeous manuscript that I'll be talking about, and also to highlight the Blackburn Heart Museum, because uh, I must confess that most Italians, if you ask them if they know Blackburn, they'll say yes if they're soccer fans. So for example, my kids uh, are great. <laughs> they know all about Blackburn, uh, but not many people know about the, the Heart Museum. So I'm sure that this event will make it um, much better known in Italy. And I hope that as soon as we're able to travel again, to see friends and manuscripts. I hope a lot of our audience will flock to Blackburn to visit the museum. And I also would like to thank Anthea and Caroline very much for uh, leafing through the manuscript as I'll be talking. It's so wonderful to be able to abandon PowerPoint and at least see a real manuscript in the screen being touched by real hands. We're so tired of PowerPoints after a year of this. So thank you for bringing together technology and parchment uh, tonight for us. Now I chose uh, this first page, which is not particularly exciting or glamorous, but I liked to get through the book from the beginning. So it is the ink of it of the manuscript. This is a wonderful missile from the ver very beginning of the 15th century. It was written in the year 1400 by a, um, a Netherlandish um, uh, scribe called Johannes de Berlandia, uh, coming from somewhere close to U Utrecht. And he uh, signed the manuscript at the end, um, saying that he finished it on uh, July 24th, 1400, while at the Abbey of Trisulti. Now, Trisulti, perhaps the British don't know that well, it's a Tartar house just very close to Rome, like 40 kilometers south. And um, I think he was just on holiday as it was July and there's usually terrible heat at that time in Rome because very few years later, he's documented in Rome as a scribe in the papal chancery. So he was probably just there temporarily. In any case, the illuminations in the manuscript were certainly uh, done in Rome by a group of um, artists working in the context of Boniface the Ninth. This was a very, uh, well, exciting, but possibly difficult moment in the history of Rome. It was the time of the Great Western Schism. And so there were two popes around at that point, more later on. There was one in Avignon and there was Boniface the Ninth in Rome. And the coat of arms that so prominently appears on, on the right of your screen is a, are the arms of um, uh, Antonio Panchera, a man from the north, from Friuli, and he was um, he was a cardinal in 1411. So this is quite a mysterious coat of arms. It might have been added on this sheet, um, but in other places it looks mm, uh, adequately um, placed in the in the decoration. So it's quite a mystery. The, are some mysteries still regarding this manuscript. Now, this is the first page of the Missal. It's uh, a book to celebrate the Mass. And it's um, uh, a liturgical part that's not usually illustrated. It's 
the rites, uh, the prayers that the um, priest says while preparing himself for the mass, while dressing. Now let's move on through the manuscript to a rather exciting part, uh, leaf 142 verso and 143 recto. So as Anthea and Caroline leaf through, you can see the wonderful penwork decoration, which um, is one of the uh, main traits in this manuscript. Um, Rome in those years restarts a book market. Nothing, uh, I think, had been going on for a long time while the popes were in Avignon. And as soon as they come back, artists start coming back to the city and especially the papal chancery really is important because um, these, uh, those scribes had a double career. They worked a lot. They worked at scribes writing papal documents, the litere solemnes. At the same time, they also uh, worked as pen flourishers and scribes uh, for the book market. And this is certain because they, they signed both, both types of things, uh, both the documents and the manuscripts. Now, this is the most uh, lavishly illustrated opening mm, in the manuscript. And obviously, being a missal, it's the incipit of the Te Igitur, the canon of the mass, which is a central prayer the, the priest um, says during the mass. And uh, on the right, you see the T um, of Te Igitur Clementissime Pater. Uh, and on the left, the typical iconography that goes with this particular liturgical uh, text, which is the crucifixion. So in this case, it's planned as a double page, as a, a, an opening. So on the left, a full page illumination with a very rich crucifixion. So you have Christ crucified and the two um, on his si uh, sides of it, and all the Roman soldiers uh, and St. Longinus, the Virgin fainting and lots of people, very rich crucifixion. And on the right, a very unusual iconography because it's basically the deposition of Christ. Uh, as you can see, he's on his mother's lap, but um, there's also um, other elements like the angels carrying the cross, sort of an exaltation of the cross on top, and the, the, the tomb on the right um, is waiting for uh, Christ to be placed in the tomb. But at the same time, this type of uh, presentation with the, um, the lid on one side and the two ladies behind it is a sort of illusion. It indicates the resurrection, the typical iconography for uh, after uh, Christ is, uh, has resurrected and uh, the Marys arrive at the tomb. So it's really an anticipation of the, the first mass that we would find if we leaf through the following pages, which is the mass for Easter. So a very uh, intricate uh, iconographic program. And underneath you see images of the, the Cardinal owning the manuscript in prayer on the left and on the right. And again, the repetition of the coat of arms with the cardinal's hat on top. Now, Cynthia, please do interrupt me because I didn't check my 10 minutes when, when I started, so. You've got about four minutes. Okay, great, wonderful, because I really want to concentrate on this uh, double opening and then I'll show you just the calendar uh, in a few minutes. So um, it's, it's not uh, the topmost art that one could get in, in Italy in 1400. Cardinal Acciaiuoli, um, who also uh, had a missal written in those very years in Rome, uh, he sent it off to Florence to have it illuminated. It's manuscript 30 in Cambridge Fitzwilliam Museum that I also talk about in, in my uh, essay. Uh, well, Acciaiuoli came from a Florentine family. He wouldn't want these illuminators in his missal, but he had it written and the pen flourishing is uh, Roman, definitely. Um, the owner, Antonio Panchera, in this case, he's a very close person to Boniface IX. And um, he comes from Friuli, so he obviously appreciated the Roman illuminators. He was the, one of the first to be allowed to use part of the papal coat of arms. So as you, if you notice, um, the, the coat of arms that we're looking at, it has a, a star in the bottom part, and the topmost part is um, the Tomacelli arms, the 
arms of Boniface the Ninth. And uh, as far as I know, Boniface was the, was the first pope to do this. This is typical in the Renaissance. Renaissance pope, they were always allowing their friends and people close to them to use, uh, to partition their arms and use the papal arms. And as far as I know, Tomacelli, Mm, the Tomacelli Pope, Boniface IX, it's, it's the first one to do it in the Middle Ages. Now, as my time is running out, perhaps I should show you another opening, uh, number 10 recto. So we'll go back, um, back through the liturgical year. Now, in the first part of the manuscript, you'd find the temporale, or the masses for the Sundays and for the main uh, feasts. And uh, following the Te Egitur, you'd have the Santorale, the saints' feasts, and we're going through and looking at the penwork, decorated letters. It's very eclectic. The uh, Roman illuminators um, chose many different models. They were influenced by the Florentine illuminators, but also Bologna and elsewhere. And this is a very richly illuminated um, calendar, as you can see. We're missing, we're missing January and February. There, there's a few lost um, leaves in the manuscript. So we're starting with March, and you can see uh, Aries on the left, on the right, the zodiacal sign, and underneath in the center is a man blowing on two trumpets and two tube, and that's Marcus Cornator, a typical iconography for uh, March. It's uh, uh, March playing the, the horns for hunting. Um, and it's copied literally uh, from uh, another um, very well-known manuscript that is now in the Getty Art Museum. It's manuscript 34, um, a manuscript illuminated uh, in Bologna by the famous master of the Brussels initials, um, Giovanni da Frasilvestro, now uh, known as. Um, and that manuscript was in Rome in around 1400 because it had been made for Cosimo de Migliorati, who became uh, Pope um, Innocent VII. And as a cardinal, as Cosimo de Migliorati, he was in Rome. And so the artists working in the Blackburn Missal had the opportunity of copying it. And all the labors of the months are copied from that manuscript. And yes, if, that I'm sorry. I have to stop. So yes, I, well, I, I've gone through the main, uh, I could talk about this manuscript for all night. So <laughs> I don't want to take up the time of my friends and colleagues. So I'll absolutely be silent. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Francesca. And now we will um, close this. Um, beautiful thing and we'll move on now to the Blackburn Hours um, and uh, Scott uh, McKendrick is going to take it from here. Thank you very much Cynthia and thanks not just for the opportunity to talk yet again about this book but the, the, the prompt, the initial prompt to return to this manuscript. Uh, one of my favourite manuscripts and one that I first saw back in 1998 and uh, published on it in two, 2003. And in the intervening period, it's been quite useful to have that time to sort of reflect, see other things, and then come back to it in some ways uh, quite fresh uh, to it. Uh, it was a bit of a challenge. I was a bit worried that, uh, as, as often <laughs> in returning to things, whether anything new would emerge. Uh, I think uh, quite a lot did emerge, which is good. Uh, not just in itself, because, but because actually I believe this is a really, really important manuscript, a real, real treasure. And uh, it's fantastic that it's in Blackburn's collection. It deserves to be much better known. And I hope, you know, in the public, through the publication, it will get the exposure that it deserves. Um, it is it is something that I could be, think 20 years down the line one could return to this. It won't be me, I suspect, but one could return to this and I think find out even more about it. So the piece that I've written is definitely still uh, a work in progress. What is the manuscript? So it's a small book. 
It's smaller than uh, Francesca's book. Uh, I think each page is about the size of a, a postcard, just to give you some sense of the scale. And I think you can see that from the hands. On the one hand, it's incredibly typical, almost ordinary. It's a book of ours. It has pretty standard text. It has a lot of very standard iconography. You can see the, the crucifixion there uh, with a lot of elements that are quite standard. And it's pretty typical in many ways of what you would expect of a luxury, a sort of top of the range uh, book of ours produced by professionals or commercial producers in the S Southern Netherlands. Uh, and particularly around this date, which I, I date this to around 1490. And I think one can, well, I have evidenced that within the uh, chapter. So if that was all that was true of this book, then perhaps we wouldn't care. But we care about it, or I care about it, and I hope others do, uh, because of the exciting, innovative, uh, exciting, innovative treatment of that standard imagery. Uh, it also introduces some really new and quite unusual subjects. And I'm going to come back to that when I talk about this opening and two others. It's also the case, it's also unusual in that I certainly believe that it's all of the illumination, the initials, the borders, the miniatures, everything uh, is by one hand, or at least one hand with some assistance. Uh, and that is very, very unusual at this date within a South Netherlandish context, you'd expect an army of people uh, involved with multiple uh, stylistic interventions and more specialist hands. The other thing is that I think uh, in, in total, it, it, is, it includes some of the most innovative uh, illuminated pages uh, from this period, uh, full stop. It, 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 I think this, this page that you're looking at, and I'll explain a little bit more why, I think it is one of the great openings uh, of this type of, of book that you would see. Um, it really is up there. So what uh, did I say, or what did I talk about in the chapter? Well, apart from you know outlining the, the text and what the illumination was, locating the manuscript, which isn't straightforward because actually unlike Francesca's uh, manuscript, there isn't a colophon, there isn't a date, there isn't a, a, a name scribe. We don't know any of those details, dates or personages. So locating it isn't entirely straightforward. Uh, but broadly speaking, this is, this is a, a work of uh, an artist, an anonymous artist called the Master of Edward IV. He's a Bruges trained artist, but he's now working much further south. Exactly why he's there, we don't know, there are various speculations about it, but he's definitely working somewhere in Southern Flanders or possibly even into Aino. So quite a considerable uh, degree to the South. So, but I think the core of the, what I wanted to talk about was the, the visual sources. And there are some surprises uh, in his use of sources that are quite eclectic. Uh, the artistic innovations, and especially relative to these double openings, and, uh, and a hypothesis, and it's really only that Ray, the person for whom this book was made, I think it's plausible, uh, but I don't think it's by any degree certain, but at least it's a, a start. So let's look at, look at this, this, well, you have been looking at this opening and taking it in. What's, what's special about it? But I think there are several things. One is the, this integration of the, uh, the, the iconography in the borders and between the borders and the miniatures. So you have the miniature, the main miniature has the crucifixion and in the borders you have this uh, passion sequence. Uh, and furthermore, that, that sequence runs across the opening in a very interesting way. If you look down at the bottom left of the right-hand page, 
you actually see a figure in the left-hand margin looking up at the crucifixion on the opposite page. And there are several sort of cross-references uh, across the opening. The artist also breaks down what are often very separate spaces. So you can see that the, the figures in the lower margin actually overlap the miniature. And some parts of the miniature actually spill out of the, the miniature space. So most notably the crucifixion, the crucified Christ, which the base is inside the miniature frame. And then at the top, it's actually come out. And that's not just a sort of visual uh, tour de force, but it actually has a sort of an effective uh, intent, which is to get the viewer, the, dev the devout person, closer to and identify the, what is actually happening in the images. So can we move on to the, the, the next opening, which is we've seen the opening of the Hours of the Cross, but soon after that, we move on to one of these other rather spectacular uh, double openings. Now this one hasn't got the same complexity of um, across the pages or, or um, within the pages, but what it does have is a very good example of the eclecticism with which the Master of Edward IV worked. Because on the left-hand side, he has a scene of Pentecost, which draws on a pattern that was at the absolute cutting edge of what was going on much further north. Uh, and it's a really, really important pattern, but this is really, really the latest, if you like, and very, very new. The, the image on the right, which is an interesting work, one showing uh, St. Peter and St. John uh, blessing the Samaritans. The, um, this is a very unusual subject, but it actually draws on a much older and conservative tradition. So the sources are, are very, very different in that case. Uh, and here you have much more of a, uh, I wouldn't say traditional border, but more um, conservative border. If we move on to the last opening, which is the Office for the Dead. This is where I think there was a genuine uh, discovery. Um, again, you've got quite a typical uh, image on the left of the raising of Lazarus. The Master Red IV and his associates came up with very similar composition almost repeatedly. So it's but he, he, he never absolutely repeats himself. He's constantly rethinking this composition. And this is an interesting one, again, where the figures, those figures in the bottom right of the miniature, again, spill out of the page yeah. and almost step in to the, the narrative. But the discovery was uh, in the lower margin of the right-hand page, which is uh, much to my astonishment and, and pleasure. It's a real new find is a totally unique uh, quotation from an extraordinarily rare uh, literary text, a court text by Philip Bouton called the Mirror des Dames. And it's an almost an exact quote from it. And initially I thought it meant that it had to be associated with Philippe Bouton, but that, that idea I ended up dispensing with, but it has to be somebody who is very, very close to Bouton and that court circle at the heart of the sort of Burgundian uh, ruling class. So I think this sort of explains why this is such a spectacular manuscript, because it has, I'm sure, if it's not uh, a member of the Noyal family, as I hypothesized, it's somebody very grand and very capable of spending a lot of money, because this was a, an expensive book as well as very innovative. And I think that may be my time. That's it. Well done. Exactly spot on. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Scott. Um, and uh, yeah, it's an absolutely stunning, stunning book. Um, right. Eric, you're up next. And Eric is going to be um, showing us a few of Hart's uh, fascinating examples of very early printing from um, Mainz. 
Yes, thanks, Cynthia, and thanks again for this whole uh, this whole adventure, uh, which started uh, years ago. I I noticed in the um, various catalogs that uh, Blackburn had uh, claimed to have, you know, Gutenberg Bible leaf uh, leaf or fragment from the very next dated printed book, 1457, the Psalter from Mainz, and also from the Psalter of 1459, the much larger Benedictine Psalter. I thought, how wonderful, I need to know a little bit more about those. Um, but it always is about, you know, um, oh, mere fragments or, you know, just a leaf. And uh, that, there's actually quite a bit of great work that can be done in this field. Um, uh, I, I believe strongly that individual leaves can be uh, very useful for instruction. Um, not every institution has a Gutenberg Bible. Not everyone can go to London or to Manchester or to Princeton to see these things. So they become useful in that sense uh, for teaching. Also, uh, fragments of books are copies. They are books. They just happen to survive in a little bit different um, scale and, and luxury uh, uh, than, than the other copies did. Uh, when we talk about printed books, you know, are there 48 Gutenberg Bibles? Well, yeah. Are there 64? Yes. Um, those other ones survive only as um, pieces, but they, they tell us a lot as well. So I try to be a little more archaeological about it, and I try to look at fragments. And um, so this was a wonderful opportunity to come to Blackburn uh, to speak about these very important fragments and uh, to make a little experiment about learning as much as I could about them. And uh, you know, you'll want, you'll want this book, uh, the book that results from all of this um, because of the great essays of uh, all, all the other um, contributors Maybe even mine, if, if, if you have um, an interest or a student who's interested in this kind of archeological approach, I hope um, my little piece could be kind of a reading assignment about what do you do with fragments? What about binding waste? Is this an introduction to this topic? I think it could be. Um, so what we're looking at here is one paper leaf of the so-called Gutenberg Bible. Uh, printed in 42 lines per column of this uh, rather beautiful um, Gothic textura type, uh, printed in Mainz around 1455. And this is one leaf from one of those, what I say, 64 copies. Um, 48 are really still between their bindings. Uh, this is from a 49th that was bound until uh, 1920. And in the 1920s, this copy, which was missing many leaves, uh, was sort of sliced and um, sold in pieces. And um, Mr. Hart uh, got this one. It's from the book of uh, the prophet Joel. It's a great acquisition. Uh, it brings, you know, the, the, it brings Europe's first major printed work uh, into the museum. And um, so we know the story of this book because it has many, um, this, this leaf has many, many siblings, more than 400 of them are in my census because they were sold in the 1920s. Uh, we know something about the uh, Bible. I did quite a bit of work trying to track it back uh, in time before that. Uh, we know it came from Mannheim, Germany. And there is a visitor to the court library in Mannheim in 1789 who mentions seeing um, a, a large Latin Bible printed uh, in such a way, and uh, that can only be this one. And so this visitor is looking at the Gutenberg Bible before we even start to call these things Gutenberg Bibles. Um, so it's it's a it's an interesting part of history that in 1789 that intact but incomplete Bible was already there. It moved to Munich, and then in 1832, uh, Munich sold it as some sort of duplicate. Uh, to, to an English collector, uh, Robert Curzon, and it was in that family until 1920. And a dealer didn't think um, he could sell it as a very um, attractive Gutenberg Bible, but he could sell it as attractive Gutenberg leaves. And so these are all over the place. They're called noble fragments and um, certainly a, a great way to study Gutenberg's type. 
Can we see the next fragment? Instead of being something that was uh, cut up for commercial interest in the 20th century, um, this one is a book that was cut up for commercial disinterest, I would say. Uh, it, it had totally lost its value. Um, we're looking at a piece of the um, Latin Psalms as they were printed up quite beautifully in Mainz in 1457. Uh, this 1457 Psalter is a rare book. There are 10 on earth. Um, again, uh, London, Manchester, Princeton, some others. And uh, then this leaf. Well, what has happened? Who's cutting up this book? Well, somebody in the later 16th or in the 17th century, completely forgetting about Gutenberg or Fust and Schiffer, these important Mainz printers, and not having any value for a Latin Psalter, uh, probably emptied out uh, the shelves of a uh, defunct monastery. Uh, we're in the Reformation period. Thought nothing of cutting up the uh, parchment from this Latin Psalter for bookbinding material. And in my studies for the uh, lecture that led to this uh, uh, conference and then to this event, uh, I looked at all the other uh, 1457 Psalter fragments. And there's one in Texas believe it or not, in Austin, Texas, that is cut to the same rectangle and it has the same odd little red strokes added by a rubricator to all of the colons. The guys in Mites printed those two dotted black colons, but I think in the bottom line of the text, maybe to the fourth to the bottom line of the text, you can find colons with these red markers to sort of punctuate the punctuation. Um, those exist in this fragment in Texas as well. And that fragment in Texas we know came from Jacques Rosenthal, a dealer in Munich at the turn of the last century. And so this is the um, sort of market in scraps uh, that uh, Mr. Hart was aware of and made this very fine uh, acquisition. It's a great book in its entirety. It's a great fragment to look at because you can study it for its type a very beautiful Gothic font. It's red and blue printing, which is an innovation of the 1457 Psalter. Um, it's, if, if you're interested in the history of early printing, then between the, the Gutenberg Bible leaf and this 1457 Psalter leaf, that is a lesson right there um, for, for visitors to come, come see. Can we do the last one? It's another fragment, and, and notice there, there's a difference between the ones that are cut up in the 20th century and these ones that are sort of more honest fragments in that somebody unknowingly just used their parchment for book binding material. And um, we've prearranged and quite correctly um, exhibited this one sort of sideways because it's no longer a book, uh, it's no longer a piece of the 1459 Psalter from Mainz. It's an old book binding. And so here you can see the blueprint of that book binding. You see uh, that this was the soft cover of some slender folio. And you see the spine. You see probably some sewing holes that held the, the choirs of, let's say, a paper document of some kind uh, in here. And you see that one of the supreme efforts of early Mainz printing was thrown away and used as binding waste. And this is this, this is this kind of archeological uh, site that I wanna excavate. Um, you know, when were these things uh, lost? When were they forgotten? That's, that's an equally good history of a book. Uh, if a book was uh, preserved and has always been in a beautiful library in London or Manchester or Princeton, you know, that's, that's one thing. Uh, if it's a book that um, ran into the Reformation it's a book that was in a monastery that suffered from pillaging. If it's in a city that had bookbinders whose economy included just buying stacks of old parchment from old monasteries, that's a fascinating history. Um, we don't know exactly what book this was on. Um, all of the other 1459 Psalter leaves that are out there, they tend to turn up on, again, late 16th, to mid 17th century books all across Germany. And that's the history of books that these fragments can bring us into. In the essay, I also go into some typographic minutia. 
let's save that for another time, maybe a good read. Um, and I hope you do enjoy getting the book. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Eric. It's absolutely fascinating archaeology. Um, uh, Rebecca is now going to um, talk about what to do with this um, heritage um, uh, in a local, national, and international context. Thank you, Cynthia, and um, all of uh, my fellow writers and speakers this evening. Um, I am going to do some of that. I, I also want to uh, reflect on what's just been said and not commit myself to any answers to those enormous topics right now about what we do with anything. Um, I should say also, please keep staring at this amazing book binding. Um, I was invited to show some coins and decided not to. I am a coin specialist um, rather than a specialist in either manuscripts or printed books. And I declined to do so despite Blackburn's internationally astonishing collection and specifically hearts um, for which we have all of his documentation which makes it one of the most unusual and rich collections really anywhere on the planet for understanding not just the coins themselves but how and why they were collected and what that might tell us about understanding them in the future but as i said i declined because i'm not talking about coins in the volume and Apart from showing you some glittery things, I don't necessarily want to talk about specific coins right now. But in a shameless plug, I'm going to put in the chat um, an article that I co-wrote with a student who visited Blackburn from the University of Saskatchewan a few years ago, uh, which is all about Hart's coin collecting and his habits there. Um, so already you can see the enmeshing of the collections in international research, um, and I think that shows off some of the richness of the documentation that goes with it. Um, also, we, we hope that it's informative. Um, have a go, see what you think. Um, but what I did want to do is pick up on some themes that were raised by all of the speakers this evening and that I address in my chapter. Um, Cynthia invited me to provide an afterword for the volume, which meant among other things that I had the great joy and privilege of reading all of the chapters, um, which is an easy thing to miss doing when you're in an edited volume very often. Um, but I'm so very, very glad um, that I did. And I found them all completely fascinating. The material in them was as wonderful and exciting to those authors as the coins were to me. And I really enjoyed sharing that sense of excitement. Um, but it also made me think about the dangers that face heritage today, about the local attachments that ascribe to it, and the ways in which, uh, and I definitely don't want to end on anything other than a high note, um, but it is worth alluding to the ways in which national policy have the power to enrich, to support and to threaten these wonderful things that we're all here because we care about. Um, so I won't say very much about that, um, but I want to work through the presentations we've had this evening of the book and the material and just think about how those speak to heritage, national, regional and global. Um, I wanted to start actually with your introduction, Cynthia, um, and the fantastic achievement in times of difficulty in getting this book out. Um, I was, you were absolutely right, astonished when the proofs came in and then when it came out. I have never been in a publication that happened so quickly and it is beautiful. Um, so thank you to everyone who's involved in that. But I think that speaks to something bigger about the Blackburn collection and these materials. Um, we see here times of difficulty for this poor piece of, uh, of parchment, the ways in which, as, as Scott has pulled out, um, sorry, as Eric has pulled out, the ways in which it charts times of difficulty, times of challenge and times of opportunity. Um, what fascinated me researching Hart's coin collection was a sort of pull and push that he always had between wanting to save money for the company and wanting to spend money on coins. Um, and he left his collections to Blackburn in the knowledge that this was a community that faced many difficulties at that time and has faced many since, but a community that he believed would be strengthened in those difficulties and potentially lifted out of them by the possession and the interaction of things of beauty and cultural richness. And I think this volume is testament to the continuing power of that love of beautiful things and the thoughts we can have about them, 
even in challenging times. The thing that struck me most as Francesca was showing us that first manuscript was another element of the collection that brings me back to it time and time again. I ached to be back in Blackburn Museum and Art Gallery, or in fact, any museum, I confess. And that was wonder. When that double page spread was opened, I don't care that it wasn't the best that Rome could produce at that time. I, I take your historical point, but it was glorious. Um, and it was exciting and engaging to follow you through the explanation of what you could see with expertise and with a deeper vision that enriched my own engagement beyond that first um, slightly magpie-ish response. I think that too is a power that we forget at our peril and the one that we all should look forward to re-embracing as the world returns to some new shape of normal in which we will need as before and as always as human beings to be informed by the past in shaping a new future. In Scott's reflections on the work that he'd looked at, what struck me most was the notion of work in progress. That in 20 years time, someone else might come back to this manuscript and find something new in it. And that's a theme that I really um, make forcefully in my chapter in this volume, which is that as long as we have the things that the past has left us, we have something incredibly valuable to go back to. Our questions, our ideas, the experiences we bring to it will all change. And as they do, so will the things we see in them. We may also find out new things about their historical context. That's certainly what some of us professionally hope to achieve. And that too will inform the intersections that people bring to the stuff. And I think when we think about heritage management and heritage policy, that is invaluable. The realization that we are never done with this stuff. We're never finished. It can never be put away, put in a box, digitized and made unavailable because we never know what might come next and what new eyes will see. And fragments for a coin specialist was a, a wonderful place to end. Every coin is a fragment of the past. Um, every coin is to the untrained eye, perhaps a small and unedifying object. Um, and in another talk, in another time, maybe even in the wonderful visitors room that Blackburn Museum now has with some of you, I would be delighted to talk about some of those unedifying fragments of the past, which can in fact teach us enormous amount. But again, that brought me back to a point that I made very strongly in my chapter, um, which is that I think what draws me back to the objects, to museum collections time and again, is the sense that in them, we have, however fragmentary it is, some echo of all of the people who have gone before us. There is a power in these objects because of the lives they encapsulate, the loves, the apathy, the neglect and the glory that other people have found in them. And that gives us the possibility to rediscover those things in ourselves and our present. And I rail a little bit in that chapter about the ways in which national policy forces museums like Blackburn, particularly the museums in places that are not London, Oxford and Cambridge, although I appreciate they have their own difficulties too, um, to compete not for our attention, I think they have that. The fact that more than 100 people have turned out tonight to look at these things on a screen shows that our attention and our admiration is there, but to compete for the funds to make it possible and the space to keep these things safe. And so I would like to end by thanking the staff of Blackburn Museum and Art Gallery for this evening, for the display they've put on for us, but much more than that, for the care that they have given to the collection for as long as I've been working with it and for many, many decades before that, for their commitment to making it available and present and exciting, for interacting with the communities that are around it and helping those objects to speak. I would also encourage you all, of course, to buy this fabulous book with its glorious images and some extremely thought-provoking chapters. Um, and to come to Blackburn when we're all able to do that again, to explore the galleries which are full of much more than we've seen tonight. But also 
for those of you who have read the book, I spend a lot of my chapter talking about my own hometown, Wolverhampton, um, a place a lot like Blackburn, known mainly for its soccer team with its own city museum, not quite as gloriously well endowed as the Hart Collection, but I understand it's got an amazing pop art collection these days. Um, but I would therefore encourage you all, as we head out of lockdown, to find your own Blackburn Museum and Art Gallery as well, to look at the things that are local and regional and that can so easily be overlooked. I know I spent my entire childhood, that's where I began in my reflections in the chapter, overlooking the wonderful things that were right there in front of me in my hometown, because it seemed like culture was happening somewhere else and heritage was happening somewhere else. And it never is. The past is our present and everybody's future. And therefore, for bringing all of this together, for encouraging the thoughts that have come out of it, for the discoveries that will follow, and for the hope that many of you who've not been to Blackburn will visit it, and for those of you who have, will flock back to the museum when it reopens, and for years of shouting from every rooftop that is allowed about how special this collection is, thank you, Cynthia, for a great book and for all of the work that led up to it. Thanks very much indeed, Rebecca. That was um, really fantastic. Thank you. And indeed, here we are. We are in our present, um, our future and our past. 